Welcome everyone. We're, we're a relatively small group, but because we're doing Facebook live streaming, um, we need to use the microphone so that the video catches the sound well. Um, this is being uh, Facebook live streamed and then uh, will be available on the YouTube channel. So we're sort of in the 21st century, uh, though we couldn't get the printer to work. <laughs> so, um, but I want to welcome you all uh, to the Eastside Freedom Library. Um, I have known Richa for quite some time and I'm thrilled that she wanted to bring her book here. And we try, uh, when we're able to plan far enough in advance, um, if we have an event with an author, um, to have people who have also read the book and will engage in conversation with the author. Um, and then the rest of us can jump in, even though we don't know anything. That doesn't stop us. Um, but we will have an opportunity also to know more, because Richa has brought copies of the book. And so if you have not had a chance to get one, and she's offering them at a significant discount, um, so uh, they will be available afterwards. Um, there are restrooms downstairs, um, and hopefully we will have a lively conversation. So, Richa? Thank you all for coming today, and thank you so much, Peter, for having this forum for Hungry Translations. I want to thank Ajay and Elizabeth for agreeing to engage with the book today, and also want to thank my Paraksathis, especially Mubina and Divya, for uh, also helping to make this happen. And uh, I'm so excited that Sarah is also here. Uh, Sarah Mosefer uh, is one of the co-authors of the postscript the, um, of, the, of the book. The, uh, of, uh, so the, that the postscript is co-authored with Sarah and Siddharth Bharat, uh, who's in Bangalore. But thank you, Sarah, for being here. So I want to just say a few things about the book first, and then I'll just read a few uh, different portions from Hungry Translations. The title of the book is Hungry Translations, Relearning the World Through Radical Vulnerability. So Hungry Translations is about learning simultaneously and in profoundly embodied ways from sites of learning that we often regard as disparate in academia. Hungry Translations is an invitation to all of us to explore modes of co-living, co-learning, and co-evolving with one another in search for justice, even when we necessarily come from violent structures that make our locations not only diverse, but also deeply unequal. Specifically, the book connects three epistemic and pedagogical sites to grapple with the challenges of building situated solidarities that are grounded in the languages and textures of specific places, times, and struggles. So the first is the journey of SKMS, the Sangatin Kisan Mazdoor Sangatan, which is a movement of chiefly Dalit small farmers and manual laborers in Sitapur district of North India. The second is a multi-sided radical theatrical approach called Parak or Critical Eye that was founded with co-actors in Uttar Pradesh in 2006, that was named in Minnesota in 2008, and that brought together 20 actors from very different locations in Mumbai in 2014 to undertake an intensive six-month-long journey with a short story that's only seven pages long that resulted in the making of a musical play, Hansa Karo Puratan Baad. The story is Prem Chand's famous story, Kafan. The inspirations of these two journeys, the one with the Sangatan Kisan Mazdoor Sangatan and Parak, also pushed me to take a plunge into exploring the possibilities and impossibilities of learning from these epistemic energies and modes of collaborative being 
in the formal spaces of the University of Minnesota classrooms. So the fourth part of the book focuses on the work in the classroom spaces. So in today's reading, I'll give you a flavor of some of these, um, a few of these journeys uh, covered by Hungry Translations. So from the first part of the book, which is called Staging Stories. So what makes a translation hungry? Every translator tries to do justice by coming as close as possible to a truth of what they are translating. In this sense, the translations generated by the development apparatus or human rights machinery or prison industrial complex may seek to be just as ethical as translations that might be guided by feminist, Marxist, or other similar sensibilities. However, when a project of translation assumes that it can render transparent the meanings of complex lives or struggles, it not only consumes the other, it also annihilates that which has been othered. A hungry translation, by contrast, is distinguished by its insistence on a collective and relational ethic of radical vulnerability that refuses to assume that it can arrive at a perfect translation. It recognizes that the meanings of justice, ethics, or politics can emerge only in the shifting specifics of a given moment in an ongoing struggle, a particular convergence of subjectivities and articulations that is itself <coughs> located at a unique confluence of time and place. This impossibility of arriving at perfect translation, furthermore, keeps the relationships hungry for continuing to grapple with fluid and unresolvable sets of incommensurabilities. In other words, even as a self comes, comes together with an other, both remain alive in and after translation. The political pot potential of such engagement lies in this yearning to keep the retellings as well as the relationships that energize and authorize those retellings open and flowing. In, resistant, in, in resisting formulaic modes of defining citational architectures or methodological approaches, and in radically reimagining the temporalities and meanings of knowledge-making partnerships, these translations demand a collectively embraced radical vulnerability in which the individual ego must surrender to a politics of co-traveling and co-authorship that involves difficult refusals. In this formulation, radical vulnerability cannot be an individual pursuit. Indeed, it is meaningless without collectivity. Yet, this collectivity does not seek to erase the singular by subsuming everything in a larger whole. Rather, the singular relearns to breathe and grow differently in the plural. While this praxis may be reminiscent of Judith Butler's idea of vulnerability as a necessary condition for an ethical relationship, it builds from lessons learned in and through the ongoing work of fiercely alive collectives that define the conditions for solidarities within and across borders. This praxis of radical vulnerability opens, the, opens up the possibility of a togetherness without guarantees. It does not seek to know prior to the journey where the shared paths will lead us, but it commits to walking together with the poor travelers over the long haul in the struggles and dreams that we all have chosen to weave, unweave, and reweave together. Such co-authorship is guided by a belief that the risks and dangers of learning and growing together through radical vulnerability are worth the enrichment and meaning that the journey will give us. In foregoing the very category of a subject in the form of a singular autonomous self and in actively co-constituting an intersubjective space, such a praxis does not look for corporeal or moral protection of one individual from another. It recognizes that each of us is limited by our locations and languages, 
our pasts and presents by our desires and complicities. And now read a little bit from a very tiny piece from part two, which is called Movement as Theater. This part is called The Journey Continues, <coughs> and it focuses on the Sangatim Kisan Mazdur Sangatan struggles. Um, so this, this segment is written in, a, in the collective voice of the Sangatan, and it evolves from my uh, past collaborative writing with the Sangatan in Hindi. Unlearning caste. For nine women to come together and weave a dream is one thing. For several thousand people to build, build collectivity is quite another. A growing Sangatan wrestles with what it means to have a shared leadership where political analysis and strategy are not concentrated in a few heads and hands. If the Sangatan encompasses all of life and not merely a few compartmentalized problems in the form of projects, then every Sathi must have an opportunity to evolve with respect to their socio-political analysis and relationships in the collective. If the knots the Sangatan wants to wrestle with are tightly wound up in caste, class, gender, and communal differences, and in the games between the powerful and the resource poor, then what methodology can we deploy to deepen its growth in both numerical and analytical terms? Satis of SKMS began earnestly to ask these questions in 2007. It is a time of serious reflection on the next course of the struggle. Between March and June, members of the Sangatan travel far and wide. While a few of us grapple with these questions by building new dialogues with supporters in the United States, many more Sathis organize and join foot marches in those villages from where people have come to the forefront to advance the struggle for the just implementation of the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, Narega. <clears throat> During one such march, Surbala, Reena, Richa, S, and Brahma Prasad spend the night in the village of Sabelia and Pisama, where Dalits form the majority. A cluster of about 15 families live under thatched roofs not far from the village. When the four Sathis decide to stay with these families, the residents immediately welcome them with yogurt and water. Surbala, Reena, and Richa, S wonder where, whether Brahma Prasad, a Yadav designated as OBC, would eat and drink with Dalits. During a previous stay among the Adivasis of the Samajwadi Parishad in Hoshangabad, his inherited rituals of segregated eating and drinking had prevented him from accepting water in a Dalit home. What will he, what will he do here? As the three women watch Brahma Prasad with nervous trepidation, he lifts the bowl of yogurt by his hands and starts devouring it. A little later, when the whole village is immersed in a passionate discussion, a boy from a Yadav family suddenly appears and asks Brahma Prasad to come with him for dinner. It turns out that the Dalit families had themselves arranged for his meal to be cooked in a Yadav household. Bewildered, Brahma Prasad asks his hosts, why did you have my meal cooked elsewhere when I have already accepted your food and water? This incident and many others like this catalyze serious conversations on casteism. Why do Dalits feel burdened with the responsibility of maintaining the violent rituals of untouchability? What difficult contradictions must each of us wrestle with in order to begin disentangling ourselves from the intricate cobwebs of untouchability that we have helped to nurture at different times. While Savarna Sathis often claim that they oppose casteism, the journey is never straightforward. For instance, a Savarna Sathi who had eagerly signed up for the Abha Padyatra or foot march withdrew at the last minute when he found out that, that the Sathis will eat and drink with any and all. Even Reena's Brahmin husband, Ram Naresh, created a big fuss about her participation in the march. The matter, however, is not simply one of Savarnas versus Dalits. Of the eight young men from Sabelia village who joined the Padyatra for three days that summer, 
One is a young man whom everyone refers to as the village idiot. This man is no other than Tama, who despite poor vision, walks miles and miles with the Satis, energizing everyone with his magical voice and songs. The same Tama initially refuses to eat food prepared in the home of Aradas, who are considered lower than his own Pasi community in the caste order. However, Tama soon realizes that the true joy of making music in and for the struggle resides in relearning to walk with the Sangatan over the long haul. This involves breaking the rituals of untouchability and segregation with every breath. Nothing in his life thus far has given him the tools to perceive this possibility or the strength that comes from such collective resistance. At the same time, the everyday practices of casteism are so deep that it is never an easy or one-way street. It is hard to predict how far any of us are prepared to go in this journey and to fight everything that has been handed to us in the name of our pride, purity, aesthetics, traditions, and values. We remind one another of the ways in which casteism might creep up on us in moments when we are least equipped to address it adequately. For instance, what lessons are buried in the reality that whenever I consume whatever food or drink is offered in the Sangatan, my satis worry that my body might fall prey to food poisoning and I will become a liability on them. The difficult journey of unlearning caste in our everyday lives and in, and in the intimate systems that include our bodies continues for each one of us. Part three. This part um, is focused on the making of the or the transformation of the story Kafan into Hansa Garu So um, it's it's titled Part three is titled Living in Character, and this is a poem called Nourishment. Don't be scared of my bony arms. You look so worried about the pale yellow of my dye of my dry dark eyes bulging out of the sunken sockets on my fleshless, tobacco-chewing face. She says, spilling guts out, glass bangles cascading, her laugh rumbling hail, Mumbai monsoons, coiling the thickest, darkest knee-length hair into a loose bun, stirring the sauce, turning over the paratha on the tawa, rolling the next ball of dough on the chakla, she holds my gaze with hers, a pledge, a pledge she demands softly, no riddles today. She laughs, barely breathing. These wiry fingers can hold your face without cracking when you feel fatherless, motherless, loverless, childless. They will feed you nourishing hot meals that calm your anxious soul, your fight, my plight. Eat. Don't feel guilty I feed you with my belly stuck to my spine. I will feed your mother too if she will let me, if she will remember me, a buddhya, in a sari, in a bindi, a dying body that lived, loved, lived, loved, laughed, hungered, fed, not in this everyday attire I wear for the world. Fidelity is demanded of me, acting, living, laboring, without compromising, Hansa the soul, was processing desires, unpossessing attachments, dispossessing dreams, repossessing spirit, my own terms, kicking sacred books, claiming religion namelessly, freely, abundantly. Hair bun waves, wrists, roast, she smiles silently now. Closing my eyes, losing myself, singing Hansa the soul again, Yet again. From the same section, labor pains, and 
this section is about. It, it's part of a longer section called Muntaz as Budhya. It is the month of August in Mumbai, and torrential downpours are making such a clanging noise on the tin roof of Tefla studio that it is hard for us to hear one another speak. Yet the energy of the group remains unaltered despite this ringing disturbance and the dampness of our clothes. Binod and Sumit just took a turn and impro at improvising the opening scene of the story where Gisu and Madhav are eating roasted potatoes, and now Al Alok and Bhagwan Das, aka Bidi, are working on the same scene. Today, Bidi and Alok have introduced a pretend chillam in the scene that is allowing them to bring out the, dif the different nuance in the intimacy and interdependence of Gisu and Madhav. These are father and son. Mumtaz is a bit late as usual because she has to finish her chores in at least six homes before she can make it to the rehearsal. She quietly enters the rehearsal space, sets down her wet umbrella and her large shoulder bag in a corner, opens her damp synthetic dupatta and drops it down her right shoulder to hang over her chest and belly before tying both its ends around her waist. The young men in the room nod respectfully at Mumtazji as she moves across the makeshift stage to the corner of the room where she takes her position, half lying down and half sitting up and making moaning sounds of buddhya, while all the attention of the room is on the new dynamics and nuances that Alok and Bidi are exploring today. When Alok and Bidi are done, it's Bholes and Gaurav's turn to enact the scene and, as father and son. Suddenly, a sense of aggressive competition infiltrates the room as the men try to impress one another with their talented approaches to the text. All this time, Mumtaz is ignored. She is just an occasional moaning noise in the rehearsal space, the voice of the dying Buddha, whose death is a necessary backdrop in order for Jesus and Madhav's story to begin. As the men decide to show off their acting prowess today, Muntaz, Yasmin, Medha, and I, the four women in a room of 13 men, become uncomfortable. Yasmin, the caretaker at the studio who has taken on the contract to serve chai to the group and, and who also spends time with the group watching every rehearsal and giving her frank feedback, cannot resist remarking in her Hyderabadi andaz. Today, the men in the room are really hyper. I'm glad I don't have to be buddhya in a corner. Hearing Yasmin's words, Medha writes a few words in her notebook and shows them to me. So her words are, there is too much testosterone in the room today. What if the men were asked to play buddhya for a change? I shared the idea with the group and everyone decides to try it. The contours of the room shift. Alok, Bhole, Anil, Sajjan, and Yasmin's nine-year-old son, Ajaz, decide to occupy the corner that Mumtaz has been occupying day after day. Each of them takes a turn at enacting the labor pains, and as they try to grab the attention of the onlookers by showing they can actually do a good job of being Budhya, the locus of the scene shifts from where the from the site where Madhav and Hisu are roasting potatoes to the corner of the stage where Buddhya is dying of, of, of labor pains. As each of the men and Ajaz thrash about as Buddhya, the corner becomes the new center of the room, and Mumtaz intently watches each of them portray Buddhya's labor pains. Although none of the men or boys can possibly know Buddhya's pain, they cannot help thinking of themselves as more refined actors than Mumtaz. Each of them seems to be demonstrating to Mumtaz what to do with her body when she acts as Buddhya. When the group breaks for discussion after working on the scene for, a, for an hour or so, Roshan asks the group in his usual self-conscious and critical style. Earlier, the story was about Madhav and Gisu, but now that all the Madhavs and Gisu in our group have become Buddhya, I no longer know whose story it is, he says. Neeraj raises the question, I'm not sure if the story is Marxist or feminist. No one ever calls Printon the feminist, do they? Do they even call him a Marxist? As we get into a conversation about Printon's writing and who gets to label his stories as Marxist or not Marxist, feminist or not feminist, Mumtaz remains quiet. At the end of the discussion, she says to me, 
None of these boys or Bhole Dada have ever gone through anything close to death. And, no, and not one of them has given birth. Yet every single one of them, including that little Ajaz, feels like he knows enough to teach me how to die, how to die in childbirth. I'm going to read that again. Yet every single one of them, including that little Ajaz, feels like he knows enough to teach me how to die in childbirth. So far I used to think that I can't read the story, and most of them can, but now I know that I, but now I know what I must show them as Buddha. I feel I know the story in a way that they cannot. Mumtaz's words sink in slowly and grab me. She's defining the power of embodiment. She's claiming her embodied knowledge. She's identifying and challenging the hierarchy of gender performance that has colonized the space in which Buddha is meant to die. Mumtaz has recognized that Buddha must live before she can die, and she has been moved to embrace the responsibility of participating in the collective pedagogy through which this engagement with, Buddha, with Buddha's life and death can happen. Now, read from the last part of the book. Uh, this is Stories, Bodies, Movements, a Syllabus in 15 Acts. And this is a poem called One More Time, and it's part of the syllabus. One more time, you ask me to tell you another one of those stories, piercing eyes on fire, chase the dark, turmeric saris bleed, large calloused hands pound against eardrums, umbilical cords entwine, bamboo pens stab guts, Unverified ancestors out of time turn away words. Poison dictionaries, footnotes, glossaries without permission. A million needles sigh. Wounds, desires, destinies received out of line. Snatched blessings girls don't inherit. And you ask me one more time to tell you a story using secrets sun-soaked green mangoes in heen kalonji, young feet salted in ocean's chest don't return to shore, bonded server parent unbound. Not so, not so you may heave a sob haunted, nor honor it by communing with the haunted haunting collisions, but to frame another intervention, pronounce meanings accentless, strip flesh muscle sensation, plastic petals incapable of twisting, exploring, moving, collaborating. Lips don't come together to echo, sounds rebound, unregistered. But tongues, lips, throats, guts, stripped of sensations, will beat stories flat, like a drenched old rag, beaten repeatedly with a heavy washing bat, on stone by a body squatting, bent over it, Beating, breathing, beating, surrounded by a mountain. Bedsheets, bras, salvars, shirts, skirts, saris, rags, pants, petticoats, underwear, and heavy blue jeans, blood stained and waiting to be washed before the trickle in the tap disappears, before the legs become overwhelmed by that full heavy feeling, making it impossible to stand on your feet after you are done washing that mountain. If my metaphors do not make sense, it is because your body does not know what I know from learning what it is like to beat clothes on stones under trickles of water for years, decades, generations. Yet you demand another story as if my tongue was not my own hot flesh. You retell without shiver or stammer, without feeling in a piece of your bones for a second, my wounded everyday sort of joy, pain, of that overwhelming fullness, that piercing, deadening heaviness in my thighs, moving upwards and spreading into arms, shoulders, up my neck, connect with veins of my soul. You will never realize, you cannot know, in your engagements to retell another one of these stories, you've gone without learning how to squat for hours, washing, breathing, beating, cloth after cloth on the stone before that trickle vanishes.
one more time, first flowed as I envisioned the syllabus. And I share it here as a gesture of radical vulnerability in expressing a desire for common goals in this journey where I'm asking each of, each of us to offer intimate pieces of ourselves, this is an initial offering. I invite you to respond to this poem in whatever ways make the most sense to you. Explore what it might mean for you to grapple with what Edward Glissant calls the right to opacity of one's stories, movements, and locations and to guard against an engagement with an other that slips into appropriation or into a desire to fully know or translate. I just want to say that uh, you know, so it's also a pleasure to be speaking here at perhaps one of the nicest podiums I've ever been at. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, it's a great, uh, what a wonderful building. Uh, so, since many of you will not have read the book, uh, let me first give you a flavor of the book, which is, uh, as I said, lovely and focusing especially on what is achieved in the first two parts. And as I go along, I'll be focusing more on the second part than the first part. Uh, the relationship between these two parts is also, as Richard puts it, a relationship between two hungers. Uh, on the one hand, the hunger that burns in one's stomach and must be extinguished. And you, on, the, on the other hand, the creative hunger that seeks only to be fueled and refueled. Uh, and I would also say it's the relationship between two forms of justice. On the one hand, social justice. And on the other hand, what one may call political justice. And I'd also like us to, that's one of the things that I'd like to bring out a bit more. Uh, the first part, let us say the part that's concerned with social justice, and I'm, I'm, I'm assuming most of you have not read it, so that's why I'm giving you a longer summary. Right? Uh, the first part begins with the initial band of Sathis, uh, speaking with villagers to identify how the poor might, and I quote which I hear now, might take active control of what is said about their needs and upliftment under such grand labels as development, democracy, human rights, and social justice. Nothing, illust unquote. Uh, nothing illustrates the stakes better than one exchange that is cited in Hungary translations. And I quote again, Richard, now. Uh, During one of those nightly meetings around a fire, a young man remarks, we didn't get a chance to study in a building, but haven't we made ourselves? Haven't our lives already given us the education we need to fight these systems? Unquote. That's true, another man responds. But any so-called educated person occupying an official position in a city no matter how green in age or experience, never hesitates for a second before preaching to us about anything under the sun. To say the poor, that the poor make themselves is one thing, to be able to feel this thing, this, this truth is quite another, unquote. So you know, the book goes on to chart two really inspiring stories uh, from Sitapur. One of the struggle to get water into an irrigation canal that had not seen water for 16 years, and the other of the struggle to get rightful wages owed to the residents of Singapore under a government employment uh, guarantee scheme uh, called Nandrega. I will not go into the details of the struggle against the government here. Rather, I want to focus on the concrete working of what, what we just described as radical vulnerability, the ways in which people remake themselves in the process of traveling together in the struggle. To begin with, there is a striking reconfiguration of gender relations in the SKMS, to cite from Richard's book, uh, and I quote again, while the women's NGOs working in the area always take strict measures to ensure that no men come near their meeting venues during the overnight gatherings. In SKMS, it becomes normal for women and men uh, to confer late into the night and then fall asleep wherever they find a spot in the shared halls. Sathis see this coming together of women and men 
and, uh, to lead discussions on the process of social political change as a foundational step in giving step in giving substance to all our talk of equality. Unquote. So it's not only that women are central to the process; it's also that in the process of mobilization, uh, as Richard Rivera would say, relations and cultural traditions within the community are unique too. Uh, there's a folk tradition, uh, uh, folk tradition of theatre in the region called Notanki, uh, and Richa talks about how that is remade. You know. uh, she says that she points out in Notanki, men traditionally play the, the parts of women, and it is considered inappropriate and vulgar, uh, and it's considered an in inappropriate and vulgar arena of entertainment for women to participate in. But Santoshi, one of the Sathis, argues, quote, if Notanki is not an appropriate form of performance for me as a woman to act in, then it's not an appropriate form for men to act in either. Uh, and uh, similarly, uh, caste relations are also a challenge, you know, which you're talking about, you know, which you just gave a wonderful example of. So that's the, 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 the theme that runs through the first section in the Northeast Dimension of Social Justice. Uh, it's, uh, the, the second section, maybe because of my own, Proclivities. I will confess that I enjoyed the second section even more than the first section, uh, and uh, it, in some senses, focuses on what uh, I think uh, the the the, the, the literary critic uh, Alo Gray has called poetic justice. Uh, we sometimes think of poetic justice and social justice as polar opposites. We think of poetic justice as providing consolation and courage in an imaginary real, and social justice as seeking tangible gains in the immediate political and historical context. <coughs> this is not incorrect, but it is not enough. Uh, poetic justice has a much more intimate relationship with social justice and injustice. It is the cultivation of the sensitivity, it is the cultivation of the sensitivity and imagination involved in poetic justice in the first place that allows us to recognize uh, you know, social injustices that allows us to see social injustices where we may not often have seen injustice before. Uh, it also allows us to recognize the psychic, personal, and interpersonal tools of social injustice. And sometimes uh, the criteria of social injustice by themselves uh, are far too, you know, form far too coarse a mesh of grid with which to think of these questions. And the challenges of writing in the spirit of poetic justice are wonderfully encapsulated in Prem Chand's uh, powerful short story, Kafan, you know, Richard's, uh, this, the second section, the rewriting of the story, is the rewriting of this very famous story by Prem Chand. Uh, Prem Chand is uh, arguably the best known uh, Hindi writer uh, of the 20th century, uh, and a beautiful writer, writes a lot on social issues. Uh, I mean, and I'm saying this after having read it only in translation in English, you know, but even in English, the power comes through, right? Uh, and uh, the story centers around the father and uh, the story of Kafan, which means shroud. Centers around the father and son sitting by the fire outside their heart on a cold winter night, eating stolen potatoes after combating the hunger for two days. Uh, as the two roast, and I'm actually citing uh, Richard summary here, as the two roast the pilfered potatoes and reminisce and philosophize about the good and the bad, Madhav's wife, Budhya, screams in agony with labor pains and dies by the end of the night. And that was what Richa was reading on partially. Then the two men try to gain sympathy for every, from everyone in the village to collect money for Budhya's coffin or shroud. They end up spending the money on liquor and delicious food. Once their berries are satiated, they share their leftovers with a beggar and bless Budhya for the good day she enabled them to live. Right. Uh, and as you can see, this is a kind of grim story, deeply, deeply grim story, raising all kinds of very troubling questions. Right. And Alok Rai, uh, whom, the person whom I mentioned uh, earlier, the literary critic, uh, he also happens to be Prem Chand's grandson, but I would protest any, against any attempt to reduce his attempt to one of filial piety. Right. Uh, so Alok Rai has a uh, thoughtful response, you know, to, you know, I mean, so in, in a sense, uh, Alokrai's, uh, Alokrai remarks on this, that points out that central to this kind of story is a guilty reader, as he puts it. Uh, you know, 
that is to say, and a guilty reader means somebody who is made to feel guilty because of part of the literature of consciousness. Uh, and people like Prem Chandra through their film fiction also creating the guilty reader. That's why I call it poetic justice. That's why I say the poetic justice is necessary to social justice. Right? Uh, and uh, they're extending this stigma of wrong to actions that were previously acceptable. So they are in some senses, you know, widening our understanding of what is injustice. Right? Uh, and Rai does, and I does a crucial feature of such literature, and he does it with such concision and precision that I can do no better than quote him. But it is crucial to this psychological transaction, that's just a psychological transaction where, you know, people identify something as wrong. It is crucial to, to the psychological transaction that the victims must be simultaneously damaged and undamaged, wrong but essentially harmed, needing but also deserving salvation. If, on the other hand, the victims, that is to say in this case, Kisu and mother, if the victims are shown as truly damaged, as they must be at some point, then we, the would-be liberal and essentially privileged consumers of this literature, readers of this literature, stand doubly accused. Because, of course, we are responsible for that damage. The accusing trace of the practice of cruelty, just as we would be exonerated if they were still somehow miraculously undamaged. Right? So when the damage is so great that there is no possibility left for, you know, for say when when when, they, when people are in the situation that say Madhav when he to find themselves in in terms of damage, then in a sense the reader is also left with no scope for exoneration. Right? So. As Rai puts it, you know, the essential sentimentality of Prem Chan is that most of the time the victims are shown as essentially undamaged by the violence they have suffered. And he says that Kuffin is an exception to this trend. He says Kuffin, basically its protagonists are entirely human in their humanity. Kuffin, he says, offers no toehold for optimism, not in the miraculously undamaged humanity of the victims and therefore by implication not in the improbable eruption of humanity in the victimizers. Coffin sub subverts that ultimately liberal game. There are some truths, it seems to suggest, after which no reconciliation may be possible." Unquote. Rai himself was in part responding to the considerable and very thoughtful criticism that Prentham has faced in recent years from Dalit critics, especially over Coffin. Uh, these critics have pointed out that while Prentham may have been passionately sympathetic to the Dalit cause, he was hindered by his upper caste background from offering a more sympathetic portrayal of Gisu and Madhav. In other words, Kaffin was addressed to an upper caste audience. Right? And the upper caste Samarana is the word that's often used in India to describe the upper caste audience. Uh, and from offering a more, he was hindered by his upper caste background from offering a more sympathetic portrayal of Gisu and Madhav. In other words, Kaufman was addressed to an upper caste audience and it was unsparing to them in that it did not allow them a sentiment to escape. It demanded action from them to address a situation. But when Kaufman was read by a lower caste audience, right, remember that Kaufman is originally addressed to an upper caste and privileged audience, right? but the audience has changed. Right? Now it is a Dalit audience. Right? It was overwhelmingly read as and encountered as disempowered. And that's the paradox that I want to just dwell on a bit. You know, and I, to, to tease out the implication, I'd like to tell another story. There's this uh, uh, literary critic called T.R. Nagraj, brilliant, absolutely brilliant, uh, died young. And he has a fantastic essay, which I actually think of as the best essay anybody has ever written on the relationship between Gandhi and Ambedkar. Uh, and Nagaraj tells in this essay about uh, Gandhi's fast in May 1933. And, you know, Gandhi's secretary, Mahadev Desai, uh, that the fast is about to be broken the next day. It's already known that the fast will be broken the next day. And that day, uh, Harijan, that is the word that Gandhi invented for describing the Dalits, a Harijan boy. Harijan means children of God. Right? And that's one, so that was Gandhi's way of, in some senses, providing um, recompense, you know, deifying, apotheosizing the people who had been formerly considered untouchable. 
uh, Harijan boy visits Gandhi. Okay. And when the boy visits Gandhi, Mahadev decides to persuade him, why don't you come again the next day and give some juice to Gandhi and help him break the fast? The boy agrees. And, but the next day, the boy does not turn up. Okay. Desai never finds out why the boy never turned up. That's all that happens in the story. As far as Mahadev decides that is concerned, that's all that happens. And as far as we know, that's all that happens too. So Nagaraj, you know, he's writing this 30, 40, 50 years later. Uh, Nagaraj, you know, is puzzled by this and he speculates, why did the boy not turn up? And then he has a lovely line. He says, the Harijan boy who took a decision not to keep the appointment with Gandhiji was reborn as a Dalit youth. It's a wonderful line. The Harijan boy who took a decision not to keep the, the appointment with Gandhiji was being born as a Dalit king. What does Nagaraj mean by this? He means that while Gandhi was scrupulous about reparations to the Harijan, that very process of giving reparations had unintended consequences. The process of recognizing his own wrong, that is Gandhi's process of recognizing his own wrong as an upper caste leader, and compensating, compensating it compensating for it by apotheosizing the Harijan or imbuing the Harijan with divinity because you know children of God is already in some senses imbuing the Harijan with divinity left space for only one hero right? the deeply moral upper caste leader who was capable of feeling remorse in this case Gandhi right? so even though this may not have been what Gandhi intended not at all uh, you know here, lower castes were not liberating themselves. Rather, they were being liberated by Gandhi. Yes. So, to the extent they were being liberated by Gandhi, they could experience, you know, any liberation and freedom received from somebody else is always disempowering. Uh, so, I mean, uh, I cannot give somebody their freedom. If I give them, some, them their freedom, then in some sense it is not their freedom. Right. And this was exactly what was happening. So, as as, uh, as uh, you know, Nagaraj puts it, Ambedkar, that is say, the, the most prominent of the leaders of the Dalit, had no choice but to reject Gandhi, whatever Gandhi's intentions may have been. And I think it's a beautiful way of putting the, the paradox, the crisis. Something similar must be said about the current criticisms of Premchand by Dalit thinkers. Kafan leaves space only for an upper caste reparation. And not for lower caste mobilization and empowerment. Premja, who is deeply influenced by Gandhi amongst others, appeals to the upper caste. And it is as part of his appeal that Gisu and Madhav are shown as dehumanized. It is now the responsibility of the upper caste, in Premja's story, who have dehumanized the Dalits to make reparation. But precisely because of this logic, right, which you only empower the upper caste. Uh, Kafan must be rejected by Dalit thinkers. Yeah. Or indeed by those who ally themselves with the Dalit politics. Yeah. So this is a, 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 you know, in some sense a tragic paradox that of, of the situation. Uh, and uh, this is where the play that is put on in December 2014 by Parak Theatre in Mumbai Hansa Raghupadazan Bath becomes to my mind especially powerful and suggestive. Okay. Uh, for it does two things. One, it attempts a certain social justice, and two, it offers a poetic justice appropriate for our, two, for our times. Uh, these are the two things I was planning to mention. The social justice I'll be quick about because I think in some senses the excerpt that Richard gave already uh, was getting at that, the same thing, right? That, uh, you know. But I mean, before actually, before getting that, to get, to get to the first matter of social justice, I want to also dwell first of all on the way that social justice is involved simply in the genre. Okay. In other words, let's remember, Premchand wrote a short story. Okay. Parak produced a play, which of course raises the question, what's the difference between a short story and a play, a genres? Okay. And of course the lines between genres are always blurred, and it's very difficult to draw a line between genres in any clear way. But still, broadly speaking, I could say that, I think one could say the play as a genre has a more active relationship with social justice than does the short story. Right? 
I'm not saying this, that short stories don't raise issues of social justice. Of course they do. I mean, any, anybody can see that if you think a little of short stories. Uh, but usually the reading of a short story is an essentially personal experience. Right? Uh, that is to say, I read a short story in solitude. Yeah? It works on my conscience in solitude. And even if my experience of re reading the short story makes me want to reach out to others, maybe form a community with others to bring about some change. But there is an essential solitude to the experience of the short story normally. Right? By contrast, a play is designed to be social and collective. This is so in two senses. One, there are all the actors. Very rarely you have something like Waiting for Buddha with only two actors. Most of the time you have quite a few actors. Right? And actors are engaged in a conversation with each other and with the director. So this is a collective process of interpretation involved in putting on a play. Then again, there's the audience. Right. It's very rare that you have an audience of one. Normally you have an audience of more than one. Right. And there's a conversation with the audience going on, and between the audience going on. Right. Uh, so there's a certain kind of sociality inherent in the play as a genre. Right. Which is why, of course, uh, you know, street theatre has been such an important part of, uh, of social justice movements. Right. So by the very process of restaging Kafan as a play, I think, in some ways, you know, Parak is already bringing, foregrounding issues of social justice in a new way. And also, one can see this in the way that Richard, you know, tells a story on the stage of the play. The lovely story, especially of Mumtaz Sheikh, right? And how Mumtaz plays with here, and then, you know, the exact passage that you were uh, uh, reading up was the passage that I also picked down as exemplifying the kind of transformations that are being brought about, right? Because Mumtaz's identity changes in the process. Mumtaz, as a Dalit Muslim woman, you know, has a new experience. And this is also an experience that's shared more widely. Okay. So, you know, and again, those on the, and Richard also writes about how those on the, many of those performing are on the margins of Bollywood film industry. Right? And they can identify with Kisu and Madhu which makes a difference to how Gisu and Madhav themselves are perceived. Right? So Gisu and Madhav are set free. Right? Uh, not set free in a certain, certain sense. You also, the, there are all kinds of things added so that Gisu and Madhav become, their, their situation becomes more comprehensible. Right? So as the play is rewritten, as it becomes, as, as the short story is written into a play, as it becomes Ansar Prabhu Puratamba, themes that are recessive in Kafan come to the fore. Humanizing Gisu and Madhav in new ways, pointing more forcefully in the process to the potentialities of the situation, making it closer in spirit to a Dalit critic of caste than to the sub Savarna critic of caste that claims in the nature. Right. So there's a, critic, there's a critic of caste in both cases, but the first one was a Savarna critic, now there's a Dalit critic of caste. And that transformation has, been, has happened as in the process of the rewriting of the play. Uh, as Richa notes, I quote her now, it's the violence of untouchability that teaches Madhav to appreciate the art of thievery, something that his father congratulates him for, subtly but proudly. We recognize how the exploitation of Dalit Mazdoors by the Thakur or landlord inspires Gisu and Madhav to detach themselves from certain material pursuits of the world that surrounds them. Unquote. So you know, to me, it seems that this reinscribing of the poetic justice of the play, you know, the staging of the poetic justice of the play for a new time, is one of the most crucial things that the play does, that the book does. Uh, as I end, I'd like to just, uh, you know, briefly ask each other two questions. Uh, one has to do with radical vulnerability, which you described so very nicely as a process in which the individual ego must surrender to a politics of co-traveling and co-authorship that involves difficult refusals. Uh, as you point out also, very nicely. Such radical vulnerability is, is, is meaningless without collectivity. And I suppose, in a sense, what, what, what comes across in Richard's uh, essay really very well is how with radical vulnerability there are no longer clear leaders and left and clear left. Right? The, the whole process becomes much more crazy. And this, I think, I think we'll all agree, is a wonderful way of enacting a more democratic politics. Uh, my, my question is in the spirit of that more democratic politics. It comes from my interest, as you might guess, in the practice of civil disobedience. 
uh, civil disobedience too is a radical vulnerability. But here, radical vulnerability is not so much to poor travelers, though there is that too. Uh, it is uh, to the opponent and to the enemy. So, one thing I'd love to hear more from you on about Richard is the place of and for the radical vulnerability of civil disobedience in the kind of politics you're talking about. The second uh, theme that I'd just like to ask us to, 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 to talk a bit more about is solitude. You know, one of the most interesting books, moments in the book for me was is where you are described as a Descartes, as somebody who writes. Uh, as uh, one as a collaborator, Richa, has puts it to, to our Richa, I quote her, I, I'd be moved by your writing because you can write in our language in ways that make our stories matter. You can write as if we have written these stories ourselves. Unquote. At the same time, we, uh, Richa, Richa, that is Richa Naga, <laughs> <laughs> it's really clear that, uh, that this writing in a collective language is not a person. As you say, this collectivity does not seek to erase a singular by something by subsuming, subsuming everything into a larger whole. Rather, the singular relearns to breathe and grow differently in the plural. Unquote. But you know, there are so many other things that you're doing in the book that uh, you know, so many other fascinating and important avenues that you explore that you do not talk too much more about what it means to breathe and grow differently in the plural. And for me, and maybe you would disagree, I don't know. Uh, the preferred term for describing the situation of being singular in the plural is solitude. Right? Solitude, as we know, is not the same as loneliness. Loneliness is the experience of not being able to converse with oneself, whether because of external or internal factors, and therefore also not being able to converse with others. One can be lonely in a crowd too, as for example in my social media today, where all that is occurring is chatter not self-reflection, and I sometimes, sometimes when I think of the cultural, social factors behind the rise of writing movements, I am really tempted to ascribe it to the rise of this kind of, to the, to the increasing impossibility of solitude, you know, and, so, and the self-reflection involved in solitude, right? For, because solitude is the activity of being with oneself, recognizing oneself as eternally divided. You know, according equality to both parts of oneself or more parts of oneself, so that one can have a conversation with oneself. One can be self reflective If, and maybe in fact, in fact, even if one is to attempt a distinction between literature and non-literature, like, it is like the distinction between the human and the animal, very, very troubling, but very, very necessary, then surely more than the quality of writing, a criterion for, discuss, for distinguishing literature from non-literature could be that whether the writing emerges from solitude and has the potential to encourage solitude. So my second question to you could be put this way. Could I ask you to reflect a bit more on how the three stages, you know, the, three, the three moments in it, uh, might, like in each of their own distinct way, cultivate the practice of being singular in the plural, whether through solitude or through some other activity that strikes you as crucial. But again, I'll just thank you once again for this wonderful uh, talk. Thank you.